Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. Our guest this evening has not showed up, so this does happen occasionally. We don't always know when it's going to happen, and it it just seems to be part of the, the landscape with doing this kind of thing. I'm going to play some clips uh, regarding civil war in the U.S., some potential uh, civil war clips I think are very interesting. Um, Probably take it a little bit short this evening, and and we'll take it from here, and uh, maybe our guests will show up sometime later in the show, but I'm thinking not tonight. I just have a feeling. In any case, um, here's a clip. Is a civil war brewing in the United States? Hi, I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. We'll get to the Obama-Trump meeting today in a moment. Pretty interesting stuff. But first, is there a civil war brewing in the USA? That is the subject of this evening's Talking Points Memo. As we mentioned last night, the voters rebelled, and Donald Trump won the presidency because of that rebellion. Just a few hours after the election was called, though, Some anti-Trump protesters took to the streets. Nothing major, but the spectacle got intense in Oakland. The main beef seems to be that left-wing protesters don't respect an honest election. By the way, that's a hallmark around the world. Every communist and socialist takeover from Cuba to Venezuela to Soviet Russia back in the early 20th century featured violence and assaults on freedom. Here in the USA, we honor protests, but increasingly we are seeing people who want our system destroyed. If we don't fight, who's going to fight for us? People had to die for your freedom where we're at today. We can't just do rallies. We have to fight back. There will be casualties on both sides. There will be because people have to die to make a change in this world. But Trump, enough with your racism. Stop splitting families. Don't split my family. Now, do I believe that woman wants to kill people? No, I don't. I think she's simply hysterical. But there are people, agitators, who do want to hurt you, who do not believe the way you do. A lot of us, especially I think as young people, are really shocked and not okay with this decision, not okay with our system. We're here to speak out. We're here to um, really create the revolution that we know is possible. Now, that woman's a moron. The revolution is going the other way, as we saw when almost 60 million Americans voted for Trump, a man with no political experience. That ballot box protest was peaceful. It's the way our republic works. No one was hurt, no one terrorized, no one killed. Unfortunately, our system is not being respected in many American public schools. More than a thousand students walked out of Berkeley High School in California. Well, it's disgraceful. And in San Francisco, there's talk that the state of California should secede from the union. I would love to see us become our own country in a way, you know, the Republic of California, because it just it feels so surreal. It feels unreal. That sounds like the South before the Civil War, does it not? Finally, the race hustlers are very angry. Chief among them, Al Sharpton 
who despises Donald Trump. But he cannot say he did not run a campaign that has created a lot of racial fears and a lot of right. divisiveness. And he played to the crowd and he knew what he was playing For to. For sure. I know him here in New York. He knew exactly what he was doing. He was playing to the worst elements. We need to analyze. This man is going to be president. And That's all that now. many of us have fought for all our life is at stake. And we're not going down without a fight. I don't even know that. So what kind of fight, Al? Are you going to encourage violence like you've done in the past? Are you going to spout hatred, which is one of your trademarks? Are you going to divide Americans along racial lines, which has made you a fortune? I'd like to see Al Sharpton run for office, and we find out what kind of constituency he really hears, not puppets at some cable network. All right. On the racial front, Talking Points has analyzed the vote on Tuesday. We found that more than a million African-Americans stayed home as compared to 2012. The stats are these. There were about 15.6 million votes cast by blacks. In 2012, that number was 16.7 million. The effect was devastating on the Democrats as Trump won Wisconsin by just 27,000 votes. In Michigan, he's ahead by only 12,000 votes. And in Pennsylvania, Trump won by 68,000 votes. Had black Americans voted the same way they did in 2012, say hello to President Hillary Clinton. The reason some African Americans did not turn out is that a number of them simply don't trust Hillary Clinton. On the Donald Trump front, he got 13 percent of the black male vote as opposed to Mitt Romney getting 11 percent in 2012. Black females supported Trump to the tune of 4 percent as opposed to 3 last time around. So Trump outperformed Romney by three points among black Americans. Summing up, Talking Points respects sincere protest. If you believe Donald Trump is not good for America, I have no problem with you displaying that opinion. However, if you hurt someone, destroy something, or promote anarchy, you then become a danger to the republic. That kind of stuff needs to be punished and quickly. Also, we are living in an amazingly destructive, politically correct environment here in America. Just because something offends you doesn't mean you have the right to hurt or destroy. The new president might want to make that very clear. And if you don't like it, Canada and Mexico are nearby. They might be happy to have you. And again, they might not. And that's a memo. The United States is headed for a total collapse. And it's not going to be just financial collapse. Financial collapse is a huge part of the equation, obviously. But there's much more to this picture. A nation that is socially unified and politically sound can quickly recover from a currency crisis, stock market collapse, or even the loss of a war. But when a nation is fractured ideologically, corruption at every level of government and finance, and when a culture that has become hedonistic, superficial, and self-absorbed, the chances of that nation holding together through a serious shock are very slim. In this video, we're not going to attempt to outline every possible scenario and every possible outcome. And we're not going to go into the technical details of why we're in this situation, nor am I going to try to prove the point that we are headed for a collapse. I've made a number of videos covering these topics that you should watch if you need the background. Here, we're just going to focus on what comes after the collapse, however that collapse unfolds. So imagine, if you will, that we're fast forwarding to that moment in time when the U.S. government has lost control. The banking system, the dollar collapse, and the people are left to choose what comes next. The specifics of how we got to this moment are blurred. And the details of the aftermath are left to the imagination. So, what will you choose? How will you rebuild? In our previous video, I put forth a challenge to tell us how you would replace the current system if you managed to topple the U.S. government. I asked this question to illustrate a point, which is that even among those who want to see this current regime removed from power, there's no consensus as to what should come next. That's a problem, and it's a very serious problem because it means that the fall of the U.S. government could mark the beginning of a bloody and protracted civil war as multiple factions battle for control. And just to give you an idea of what some of these factions could look like, let's take a look at some of the comments from that video. The idea of setting up a socialist system is very popular. This came in multiple varieties, ranging from anarcho-socialist to the socialist republic. There was also quite a few people who wanted to institute a resource-based economy. Some people thought the answer was to put Ron Paul in charge. To be honest, I'm not convinced that Ron Paul would actually want that job. We have a few anarchists and voluntarists who want to have a society where people aren't ruled over by government at all. We had some that said that the system is fine as it is and doesn't need to be changed. And we had quite a few who proposed that we revert back to the Constitution 
or restore the Constitution, though it's a little bit unclear as to what that would entail. Some people came right out and said that they would prefer to revert things back to the way they were in the 1700s, which, though unrealistic, is actually the clearest of the reversion proposals, because at least then we know what we're reverting back to. Many others say restore the Constitution, but restore to what? The very first version, where blacks were only considered three-fifths of a human and only land-owning white males could vote? Or do we move it a little farther forward to make these concessions that stop before we get to the 16th Amendment, which sets up the federal income tax? I'm not trying to answer this for you. I'm just saying that you have to be clear about what you're talking about. Now, without me taking sides on any of these issues, just take a look at these factions. Many of them are diametrically opposed and cannot be brought together in a compromise. So what would happen if these people were left to sort out what comes next while operating from our current paradigm, a paradigm in which the state uses violence to enforce its will? There's really only three possibilities. One, you all open a debate and try to convince each other which way is the right way. Good luck with that. You've had the internet for almost 20 years now and you still haven't sorted that out. I highly doubt that the conservatives are going to convert the liberals or vice versa in a post-collapse scenario and you may not even have the benefit of the internet. Option number two, you settle this issue with violence and whoever has the most guns and ammo and is the best organized crushes all the opposition. This is how these situations are traditionally handled and it's the most probable outcome if we don't work to change the paradigm we're operating from. Or option number three, we take an alternate path where people group together according to the way that they want to live and they allow others to do the same. It should be obvious that option number three is the only sane and moral option. Trying to convince everyone that your way is the right way isn't going to work, and using violence to crush everyone that disagrees won't give us a world worth handing down to future generations. Now, the third option is actually the most practical option for other reasons as well. When the U.S. government collapses, people are going to have to band together in their local communities to survive. Those that succeed are not going to be Mad Max loners roving the wilderness, but rather cohesive groups that are capable of living and working together. These groups are going to be small, and there will likely be numerous groups living in areas that were once single cities. It only makes sense that these groups are going to bring people together who are close enough to the same frequency to work towards a common goal. The most basic goal being survival. It is highly unlikely that these groups are going to immediately be capable of merging together to reconstitute something resembling the United States. This is something that may be hard for some people to come to terms with. Once the United States collapses, it's not coming back. What we're looking at is something akin to the collapse of the Roman Empire, which crumbled into many pieces, which then began to develop their own cultures and languages over time. What did the Roman Empire become? It became Spain, France, Italy. Even Germany and England were once part of the Roman Empire. Now, you can make the argument that the European Union is currently regrouping the Roman Empire. However, it should be obvious that the Roman Empire never came back in the form that it had before. Now, here's where the non-aggression principle comes in. There is no way that we're all going to come to an agreement as to how we want to live. But that's okay, as long as we can agree to at least not use violence to impose our way of life onto others. There's absolutely no reason that one community couldn't build a resource-based economy right next to an anarcho-capitalist community, or have an anarcho-socialist community right next to a constitutional community. As long as we don't initiate violence to get our way, there's no reason that these contradictory systems couldn't coexist. The non-aggression principle is really a very, very simple idea. And that's a good thing because the simpler an idea is, the better chance it has of being adapted by people with very different ideologies. Could a constitutionalist abide by the non-aggression principle? Of course they could. Could an anarcho-socialist abide by the non-aggression principle? Again, of course you could. Now, on the other hand, if you come from an ideology that does insist that you have the right to initiate violence against non-violent people to get them to do what you want, then yes, we have a problem. And that's why I keep bringing it back to this concept. The non-aggression principle is the only way that communities of humans can live together without becoming totalitarian. Now, if the non-aggression principle is agreed upon between the communities, then those communities can grow into federations which exchange resources and provide for common defense. You can think of these like states in our current system, except that member groups would be much smaller, much more autonomous, and there would be no central power like the federal government imposing its will over the group. If you organize like this, then you wouldn't need to come up with a single right way to live. We could each choose how we want to live and let others choose what they want. If the community down the road wants to try out socialism, then great, have at it, as long as they don't try to push it on their neighbors. If you really think about it, this is the only sane way to organize when a population is culturally divided. An additional benefit of this approach is that rather than monoculture and culture, which is what we do right now, you would actually have a choice. You would have real diversity of systems, and we could let these experiments play themselves out and find out what works. And maybe, just maybe, somebody will come up with something that works better than what we have right now. What I'm talking about here is dealing with culture the way we deal with technical invention. When something works, it's imitated. When something fails, we don't all have to repeat those mistakes. The problem with our current paradigm is we force everybody into the same experiment. So when one experiment fails, the whole system fails. 
Now, I've tried to come up with a label for this concept. I've considered the term federated voluntarism and voluntary federationism. To be honest, both of them sound a little bit clumsy to me. What are your thoughts? How would you rebuild? My challenge to you is to answer in a video response, but with one condition. You have to answer the question of how you would deal with people who don't want to go down the same path. Would you use violence to force those people to comply? Would you create a system of law enforcement to have others carry out that violence for you? Be honest here. Don't skirt around the question. Bonus points if you can come up with a better name than voluntary federationism or federated voluntarism. If you want more content like this, be sure to subscribe to this channel, Storm Clouds Gathering, on YouTube. For lots of other bonus content, be sure to follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash stormcloudsgathering and on Twitter at Collapse Update. And of course, our website is stormcloudsgathering.com. Coming, coming, coming. I'm not sure that the world is ready to receive this. If you don't answer the fire bill when you're a fireman, things burn to the ground. And that's exactly what's going to happen to America. It's going to burn to the ground. Get out, get out, get out. Recession, depression, currency wars, trade wars, and you know the rest, world war. I see a total systemic collapse of the United States. I see a total systemic collapse of the U.S. dollar and the financial system, which is why I urge everybody to get out, get out, get out. $100 trillion economic extinction level event is about to strike America. Viewer discretion is advised. We are moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of desperation, anguish, and national disaster. Our next stop. America's coming nightmare. It's the final Our federal government, military, and intelligence community have begun to implement emergency measures. Yet the American people have been kept in the dark about everything. Recently, all 16 branches of our intelligence community have come together to release a shocking briefing that contained an alarming consensus. These agencies, that include the CIA, FBI, Army, and Navy, they've already begun to estimate the impact of the fall of the dollar as the global reserve currency. And our reign as the world's leading superpower being annihilated in a way equivalent to the end of the British Empire post-World War II. And the end game could be a nightmarish scenario where the world falls into an extended period of global anarchy. And we're on the verge of entering the darkest economic period in our nation's history, one that will ignite a 25-year Great Depression. Some might be surprised to learn that the fate of America's economy has already been determined, verified, and announced by the Obama White House. Yet, it has received scant attention from the corporate media. In 2011, economist Kyle Bass interviewed a senior member of the Obama administration about its planned solutions for fixing the U.S. economy in trade deficit. This single seven-word response clarifies everything, explains everything, and leaves little else to discuss. We're just going to kill the dollar. There it is. The entire agenda in one short sentence. It explains everything we've been seeing domestically and globally. That one statement makes every other question irrelevant or otherwise answers all economic questions and explains everything. Nothing else matters. I urge you to ponder that statement and all it implies. Doing so will provide you with the clarity to understand not only what is taking place today, but what is yet to come. It is important to note the specificity of the word kill. Stated in the active voice, it means an unambiguously intentional and deliberate act. The murder of our national currency, the United States dollar, is the ultimate agenda to be implemented under Obama. To kill our national currency will subvert the United States, 
and destroy it from within. Obama is running up trillions upon trillions upon trillions of dollars in new debt, wherein the Obama regime is actively trying to mathematically collapse the United States. And I firmly believe that they've done it. They've reached critical mass. It can't be walked back now. This begs a number of questions, including what type of Americans would actually have as their objective, the destruction of our national currency. To whom do they hold their allegiance? if not to the American people whose life's work as well as the toil of our ancestors is represented in the form of wealth held in U.S. dollars. Does this make any sense to us as Americans? The answer is, of course, no. By its very definition, to kill our national currency is an act of high treason by those engaged in this activity. It undermines the very sovereignty and survival of our nation and will have a life-changing impact on every citizen in the U.S. It will also impact every nation and the people of every nation on the planet, as the U.S. dollar is presently the world's reserve currency. It is an act that should result in the filing of criminal charges against the conspirators, a trial of their peers, and if convicted, a death sentence. It's that serious. This was all done intentionally. It's called the Cloward and Piven strategy. Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven were two lifelong members of the Democratic Socialists of America who taught sociology at Columbia University. Piven later went on to City University of New York. In May 1966, Nation magazine, that's a real red magazine, an article titled The Way to the Poor, they outlined their strategy, proposing to use grassroots radical organizations to push ever more strident demands for public services at all levels of government. The result they predicted would be a profound financial and political crisis that would unleash powerful forces for major economic reform at the national level. Do not be deluded by the propaganda. Their ultimate goal is to leave us so discouraged, demoralized, and exhausted that we throw our hands up in defeat. As Barney Frank said, the middle class will be too distracted to fight. It's not just Barney Frank, pretty close to Saul Linsky. Washington Times had an editorial today talking about how this influx threatens to transform the nation. They say this is a man-made disaster, but they say that this threatens to transform the nation. Do you believe that? I think what we're seeing now is the, the old piven cloward strategy applied to policy. This is the, this idea that you overload the system with crisis and the system has a limited amount of capacity to deal with one crisis at a time. So we're now at a point where, there, you know, you get the EPA and then you have the Taliban and now you have, uh, you know, student loans. And then the next day we have an immigration crisis. We can't deal with this. Uh, it, Washington can, is not mm -hmm. equipped to deal with it. Uh, and this sort of opens up the area for the president to come in with executive power and try to resolve everything. And unfortunately, I don't think we're going to like the way he resolves it. This cadre of these neo-Stalinists, of whom the front man, of whom the puppet is this guy who is purportedly named Barack Obama, they taught them that the only way that you can destroy the quote-unquote evil United States and establish a global totalitarian regime is that you have to collapse the United States from the inside out, primarily economically. And the way you do that is by overloading the federal government with all of these entitlements and all of this debt and then collapse the entire thing from the inside out. We got Obama. Not bad. Not bad at all, I think. Not bad at all, I think. We got Obama. Not bad. We are past the point of no return. We will not be able to stop what is coming, but must be wise enough to prepare and get out of the way. The murder plot involving the death of the dollar did not begin with Obama, but he and other conspirators have accelerated the plans, plots, and schemes for its demise. The ultimate objective is to implement an international currency in tandem with a system of global governance. The problem is that most people are not thinking large enough nor do they understand the magnitude of the lie. They're not seeing the larger picture as their focus is diverted elsewhere. Meanwhile, others continue to adhere to or even perpetuate the dual party meme of governance 
holding dearly to the notion that there is a practical difference between the Republican and Democratic parties. Have we not seen sufficient evidence that they are now of one party acting in concert with each other? They cannot see the collusion and backroom deals and continue to hope that the next election will finally change the unchangeable continuity of agenda. Most of the elected officials are on board with the subjugation of the United States to a global system of governance. Some are actively facilitating this agenda while others are making nominal objections on the stage of political theater, whilst hoping to earn a seat at the global table. It's entertainment for the globalists, distraction of the masses, and diversionary fodder for the talking heads in the media. America has become a captured operation, captured from within. Think of the Vichy French internal collaboration with the enemy, or softening the ground for a full takeover from within. The takeover of America has already happened. The collaborators have already been installed. And we are now on a path to complete subjugation of a larger global system of governance. If you continue to doubt this, how else would you explain the numerous examples of our dual party governmental acquiescence of self-destruction? It is a magic show, and many are still captivated by the magician's many diversions, failing to realize that we are engaged in a global war while being simultaneously hobbled by enemy infiltrators from within. One reason we are seeing new stock market highs is the rush to the dollar from other currencies, especially in the Eurozone. Another reason is the monetization of our debt by the Federal Reserve, despite the previous denials of Ben Bernanke and others. Simply put, the plan by the globalists or the central bankers and those behind them is to create this rush to the US dollar like passengers from a sinking ship to lifeboats. Once the lifeboats are filled to capacity, they will be sunk and the United States dollar will be completely worthless. As in such a scenario, many will not make it. Many will die from what is coming. What does an economic collapse in the United States, what does it look like? You can expect anywhere between 25 to 50 million dead in the first 90 days. You're going to have people dropping dead from violence, looting, rioting, right? You're going to have people dropping dead from lack of medication. We are the most medicated country on the planet. You're going to be seeing people drop dead from starvation, dehydration, and disease. You see where, the, where this country is going. You're going to see more violence in the streets when people lose everything and have nothing left to lose. They lose it and they're losing it worldwide. There's going to be supply shortages. You're not going to be able to go to the supermarket and get, you know, gr get your groceries. You're not going to be able to you know, pump gas in your car. The power grid is not going to be on. I'm talking about a massive constriction in the flow of goods and services. I mean, it pretty much ceases during that point. That's what it's going to look like. It's not a pretty picture. Deagle.com has been estimating a massive population reduction and economic collapse for the U.S. 2025 forecast with an even lower population estimate at 65 million. This would mean 80% of the population would have to leave, die, or no longer be part of the United States within 10 years. Like I said, it's gonna burn to the ground, Greg. And it's, you know what, and the fire's already been lit. The biggest problem they have is they have regulators that don't regulate. Well, yeah. It's like having a fire department that won't answer the fire bell when it goes. And if you don't answer the fire bell, when you're a fireman, things burn to the ground. And that's exactly what's gonna to happen to America. It's gonna to burn to the ground because of the absolute criminal, sociopathic nature of the people that have taken charge of your country. And it's gonna to burn to the ground. We have the equivalent of a mentally defective baboon. And by that, I mean national level United States governments, not only in the executive branch, but also in the Congress. These people are not only all universally psychopaths, but they are all universally flat jawed, mouth breathing imbeciles. Unfortunately, you've grown up hearing voices that incessantly warn of government as nothing more than some separate sinister entity that's at the root of all our problems. Some of these same voices also do their best to gum up the works. 
They'll warn that tyranny is always lurking just around the corner. Tyranny is a capital T. You should reject these voices. Everything that's been done with torture, rendition, the NDAA, the Patriot Acts 1 and 2, from day one was focused on the American people, period. That's it. It's always been about erasing the Bill of Rights and Constitution and rolling out NSA spying publicly, saying it's for Al-Qaeda, rolling out total control and the end of any underground free market systems in the name of fighting Al-Qaeda, but really shutting down any type of free commerce. This is all about converting us from a free society to a tyranny with a capital T. Just as certain the collapse of the dollar is coming, so will be chaos on the streets of America caused by this plan to kill the dollar. The central bankers and the leaders selected to govern each country have effectively used the Hegelian dialectic to implement their agenda. Just as stated by George H. W. Bush on September 11, 1990, their predetermined solution of a new world order is being formed before our very eyes. They've told us what they are doing, but we have chosen not to listen or fail to understand what was being said. The U.S. has always been the firewall against the globalists by their persistence, infiltration of global elitists into our government and covert subversion from within, we are being led to slaughter. There will be some who dare to resist the pillaging of our bank accounts, the erosion of our rights, and the enslavement that comes with the dismantling of America. The dust clouds visible on the far horizon that watchmen have been reporting for decades can now be seen as an attacking army of barbarians, whose fighters are now on the ladders and cannons of breaching our empire's outer walls. Who knows how long the inner walls of our empire will survive the next wave of their coming attack. Perhaps Ernest Hemingway said it best in referencing John Donne from his novel of the same name. And therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. In Ingmar Bergman's classic film, Wild Strawberries, the filmmaker through dreams, nightmares, and flashbacks tries to make sense out of his troubled past. In the following footage, as I make use of the film's most noted and ill-omened sequence, the opening nightmare of Wild Strawberry's chief character, I try to make sense out of America's troubling and disquieting future. Our next stop, America's Coming Nightmare. From the ashes of America's coming nightmare, we can rebuild the America we love and wish to protect from our nation's insidious enemy. Except the kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, taught the Lord Jesus Christ, it can bear no fruit. Igmar Bergman's Wild Strawberries, with its nightmarish scenes of despair and death, can indeed bear the fruit of an awakening and new America.
Hi, I'm Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. We'll get to the Obama-Trump meeting today in a moment. find ourselves in the outbreak of a new global countries. The appearance of conflicts facing the world's major powers are the main topics that cause not only political experts, but also many ordinary people to worry about the very real possibility that we will find ourselves in the outbreak of a new global conflict. The war in Syria started in 2011 between the Syrian government and the rebels, involving crucially Russia and the United States with Putin supporting Bashar al-Assad and Obama supporting the rebel side. Russia is not willing to allow the US and its allies to invade Syria, since in addition to Syria being an important ally of Russia, Russia has a naval base in the Syrian city of Tarsus, making Syria strategically important for Russia in the Middle East. Not only does Syria have the support of Russia, China and Iran are other allies of Assad who are not willing to see the West invade Syria. Russia has for a long time provided military equipment to the Syrian army and sent warships to the area, recently also adding air support to the forces of Assad, as well as the sending of troops by Iran. On the other side are the alliance of America and their allies, bombarding Syrian territory and supporting the rebel enemies of Assad. Therefore, a clash between these powers and the attacks that are happening, or a clear ground invasion by the White House and NATO in Syria, would almost certainly lead to the worsening of the conflict, pushing other major nations to enter and cause the outbreak of a war on a large scale. Something similar is happening with the conflict in Ukraine. A conflict started in 2014 by the annexation of Ukrainian territories by Russia, with the ensuing confrontation between the forces of the Ukrainian government and the pro-Russian rebels. Since then, a race has happened in which Russia has been, according to reliable sources, sending troops, tanks and weapons to the pro-Russian separatists, while the European Union, together with NATO and the United States, have been doing the same thing with the government of Ukraine, a conflict that faces principally the US and Russia, as well as the European Union and NATO. Despite no direct conflict having yet occurred, from the year 2013, tensions have heightened between the two Koreas, even reaching the breaking of the armistice of 1953, which had set in stone the non-aggression between the two countries. The North Korean regime of Kim Jong-un is carrying out several nuclear test detonations, not only as a show of force, but as a response to the economic sanctions that the UN has applied to this country, and the maneuvers of American and South Korean combat forces underway in waters close to North Korea. The resumption of a conflict between North Korea and South Korea, with the participation of the US supporting the latter, would also likely see the involvement of Russia, and especially China, supporting the North Korean regime. Iran's nuclear program, which the government of Iran says has the objective of improvements to healthcare, has made powers as, such as Israel and the United States suspicious, arguing that the true purpose of the program is to create nuclear bombs to attack their respective countries, leading these countries together with Europe to enforce economic sanctions against Iran to deter them from building their suspected weapons of mass destruction. This situation has led to escalating tensions especially between Iran and Israel, with the latter declaring itself willing to attack Iran to stop its nuclear program. Arguably, the worst outcome would be that the US and Israel invade Iran. Russia and China would likely also support Iran without hesitation. 
Well, folks, we didn't have a guest this evening. Our guest didn't show. This happens sometimes. I'm sure it'll be back. So I thought I'd play a few clips. Um, first set of clips talked about the potential for civil war, and the second set of clips talked about the potential for World War III. Let's hope neither one of these happens, but it's always good to be aware. Keep your mind on potential futures. I want to thank you for listening. You've been listening to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. Have a good evening. <laughs> 